to today's operational information update on the flooding and landslide situation in BC. For today's briefing, we'll have updates from Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General Mike Farnworth, Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Rob Fleming, and Minister of Agriculture, Food and Fisheries Lana Popham. A reminder to media on the line, please press star 1 to enter the queue. You will be limited to one question and one follow-up. With that, I'll turn it over to Minister Farnworth. Thank you uh, and good afternoon everyone. Uh, I'm honoured to be here on the traditional territory of the Lekwungen speaking people and the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. The last few days have been incredibly difficult for the people in our province. Our thoughts continue to go out to everyone involved and directly impacted, impacted by the flooding and the mudslides. While the worst of this storm has passed, the impacts of this natural disaster will be with us for some time. And we all need to pay close attention to weather warnings given the unpredictability that comes with climate change. Today, for example, Environment Canada has issued a winter storm warning on the north coast. In the flood impacted areas, our crews continue to work hard to re-establish highway connections as quickly and as safely as possible. And the province continues to work hard to support the ongoing work in Abbotsford where city workers are shoulder to shoulder with the military filling sandbags and building on a temporary dike. And we're working hard in places like Merritt, Princeton and the Cowichan Valley to get these communities back on their feet. I want to thank all the crews across the province who are working day and night to protect and reconnect our communities. While this work continues, we need to keep the most severely affected roads clear for the movement of essential people, goods and services. This will help address the supply chain disruptions which we have been experiencing. Due to weather related impacts to the Trans Mountain Pipeline and damage to the roadways, there is a reduced but steady supply of gasoline. We are working with the federal government to trans more fuel into British Columbia in new ways. This includes bringing more fuel by truck and barge from Alberta, Washington State, Oregon and as far away as California. I urge British Columbians to be kind and patient at the gas stations. Everyone is doing their absolute best to make sure those who need gas get it. And I'd like to thank the gas and energy companies who are making significant efforts to source fuel for British Columbians. Right now, we all need to do our part to make sure that emergency and essential vehicles can do their jobs. As a result, today, I am bringing in two new orders under the Emergency Program Act. These orders will help keep commercial traffic moving, stabilize our supply chains, and make sure everyone gets home safely. For the first order, we are prioritizing access to gasoline in southwestern British Columbia, Vancouver Island, and the Sunshine Coast for a short period of time the next 10 to 11 days. Emergency and essential vehicles will have unrestricted access to gas as required using predominantly commercial card lock stations so anyone who uses a card lock now will continue to access fuel in this same way. Healthcare vehicles will continue to access fuel the way that they always do. Non-essential vehicles including the general public will still have access to gas available through retail gas stations. But people in southwestern British Columbia, Vancouver Island and the Sunshine Coast will be limited to 30 litres per visit to the gas station. There will be temporary shortages, but we are taking this important step to main maintain our supply of gasoline. Under the order, Gas stations will be required to ensure their gasoline reserves last until December 1st of this year. Over the next 10 to 11 days, there will be delays. So take extra time if you need to go to a, lo a local gas station and please be patient. To help ease the impacts from these restrictions and keep people moving, we're asking people to use public transit in impacted regions whenever possible. Carpool share with a friend, walk, use alternative methods. This order does not impact natural gas or heating oil used to heat homes. 
I'm asking everyone in British Columbia to follow Dr. Henry's advice of being calm, take the extra time that you need, and know that we are all in this together. The second order will prohibit non-essential travel along severely affected highways starting today. This applies to the hardest hit sections of Highway 99, Highway 3, and Highway 7. There are legitimate and essential reasons for people to be traveling through the restricted areas. Examples include the commercial transport of goods, moving essential supplies like food and water, fuel and medical supplies, transporting livestock and agricultural supplies. As roads are repaired and the backlog of essential traffic clears, restrictions on essential travel can and will be eased. We will be releasing the details on enforcement in short order. But my hope is that everyone understands the needs for these restrictions and fully cooperates. In other words, if you don't need to be traveling right now, don't. Stay home. And if you can't do that, carpool or take, pro uh, take public transit or work from home. Because if you don't need to travel, then you won't need da gas. Help keep our roads clear for commercial traffic and emergency personnel. We need everyone to do the right thing. If you don't have to be on the, on the road, don't travel. If you only need a quarter tank, leave the rest for the person behind you. If you can work from home, please do so. We've been here before, so we know how to get through this. And we will do so by helping our neighbors, our friends, looking after our most vulnerable, and coming together. I'll now turn this update over to Minister Fleming. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister Farnworth, and uh, good afternoon. I am uh, grateful to join you from the territory of the Lekonkin speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. And uh, this afternoon, I'll outline how and when the travel order affects three significant highways, which will reconnect the lower mainland with the interior and the north. Yesterday, we were able to open Highway 7 to single lane alternating traffic, and we expect this weekend that it will be two laned at some point. We will update you as that news progresses. Today, I am pleased to announce that Highway 3 from Hope out to the southern interior of the province is now open and is transporting vehicles on a priority uh, essential basis. This will reestablish a vital link, allowing for the movement of essential goods and services to and from the Lower Mainland. And I cannot overstate how appreciative I am of everybody who is involved in this incredible effort, the crews along this corridor, uh, to get it open. They have been going around the clock, clearing and repairing sections of the highway to the point where we can get traffic moving today, uh, days ahead of the initial projections that we shared earlier this week. This connection along with uh, Highway 7 from Agassiz to Hope, and then on to Highway 3 from Hope to the Interior, will be restricted. Will be restricted to the travel terms uh, in the order. That means that if you're transporting essential products or delivering vital services that we all rely on, you can use this corridor. If you've been cut off from your principal address this past week, you can now drive home. Uh, but let me be clear who this is not open to. It is not open to recreational or non-essential travel at this time. I want to provide an update on Highway 99, which links up uh, with Highway 97 just north of Cache Creek. Uh, as we all know, it has been closed uh, due to the landslides near Lillooet, and right now it is looking like this route could be open by Sunday, again, for restricted travel, where people must abide uh, by the order. Uh, we have been uh, and will continue to work closely with the RCMP and search and rescue personnel who remain on site. There was a tragic loss of life at this site, and we are respectful uh, of the work that search and rescue officials continue to do. The Sunday opening is, in co of course, contingent uh, on them being able to continue to do their work. When the 99 does reopen, in this case, it will be primarily for regular passenger vehicles and not large commercial trucks uh, at this point in time. So while we're very pleased with the progress, that hundreds and hundreds of people have helped make possible to reestablish highway connections. I want to emphasize that this will not be travel as we'd expect under normal conditions. Uh, crews will be on site with heavy equipment to continue to repair the roads. And until that work is fully complete, 
The traffic is going to be slow on these routes. We're pleased to have them reopen, but it will be slow and there will be delays and stoppages. There will be workers and uh, traffic control per personnel uh, on this route and those who are driving need to be mindful of their safety and the directions they give uh, to traffic. Um, so for those whose travel aligns with this travel order that I've just outlined, uh, you need to plan and prepare and you need to be patient. You need to drive slowly and safely according to the conditions. Do not pass pilot cars if they're being used. They are there for your safety and for the safety of everyone else on the road. Uh, prepare for winter conditions in the interior. This includes having proper winter tires and it is everyone's responsibility as always to to drive safely but under these special conditions people need to be additionally mindful. We don't want to have avoidable accidents that would cause these routes to close down again and again if it's not essential for you to travel as defined by the order then you are not permitted to, to be on these routes at this time. Uh, for those people who want to return to their principal residence um, also please understand there's gonna be a lot of trucks on these routes. Uh, please understand that your passenger vehicle will be mixed in with commercial traffic and there will be delays and you must take extra precaution uh, while driving. Um, I would like to thank again the federal government and my counterpart uh, Minister Al Galbra for really stepping up to help out British Columbians. This morning they announced some very helpful measures to help uh, fast track uh, BC truckers who don't typically travel to the US. The US is temporarily relaxing some of its permitting requirements so that these truckers can drive into Washington State and then re-enter Canada beyond the impact area. Uh, I'd like to remind people that we still have a strong east to west connection uh, in the north where we'll be able to move supplies uh, from Alberta. That continues. I'm also really pleased uh, in this update uh, to stress that uh, Canadian Pacific CP Rail uh, reports making very good progress repairing their lines. They have publicly announced now that they expect to open by the middle of next week. This could have a, and will have, a tremendous impact in allowing goods to move in and out of the lower mainland and connect the port of Vancouver uh, to rail to the rest of BC and to Canada and that's an important supply chain. Um, there is some additional reassurance uh, with respect to the fuel situation. Trans Mountain who is inspecting their pipeline infrastructure after this uh, storm event uh, advises us that they are making really good progress in getting their pipeline uh, up and running again. They have over 200 people who are working to make this happen as quickly as they can. At this point uh, they report that barring any unforeseen setbacks the company is hopeful that it can restart the pipeline in some capacity by the end of next week. Uh, in closing I just want to sincerely thank uh, all of those who've gotten us to this point. Uh, the first responders on site uh, last weekend who helped uh, stranded motorists, the towns like Hope and others that cared for uh, travelers that were stranded in their communities the restaurateurs, the voluntary organizations, the crews who've worked flat out to repair damaged infrastructure. British Columbians have pulled together uh, in a time of crisis and along with our federal partners and our local government and regional district partners and police and fire who've been so supportive, our government will continue to backstop those efforts. We will do everything we can uh, in our power to make sure that BC can have supply chains reactivated as quickly as possible. Thank you. And I'll now introduce uh, Minister Popman. Good afternoon everyone. Uh, well today has um, turned out to be another challenging day for the agriculture sector but we do have a few pieces of good news that I'll be bringing forward in just a moment. We continue to do our assessment of the damage and um, I can tell you that there are 959 farms under evacuation order. There are 164 farms that remain on evacuation alert. We have about uh, 20,500 hectares of farmland that's been impacted by the flood and about 15,000 of these hectares are designated as agricultural land reserve. We, the, some of the good news that I have to share with you today is that we have 35 vets on standby, many of them coming from Alberta, so that's very good news. Um, we uh, are seeing um, still some tensions from between uh, farmers trying to get into their 
their, far their barns uh, and the RCMP that are trying to protect people from dangerous situations on the roadways. Um, we know that um, as permits are being issued for farmers to cross those lines, uh, the time it takes from the permit to be issued for the farmer to go across those lines uh, onto the roadways, the, the conditions of the roadways are changing. It's very dynamic. There's a lot of water that's standing. So um, Emergency Management BC has requested uh, more engineers to come in from the military and that may allow us to move forward getting more precise information on culvert, the culvert system and, and the strength of the roadways that farmers need to travel on. Um, we, uh, some of the good news that I can share with you is that uh, most milk pickups are resuming in the Fraser Valley. This means that our supply management system is kicking in as predicted. Uh, the supply management system uh, is sometimes criticized, but I think this is a great example of why it's so valuable to our, our country and to our province. And so we're really proud of the, the farmers who are managing to get the food system back online. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that are asking, how can we help? They're from communities that are not affected by flood. They're outside the province or outside our country. How can we help? I can say that for folks living in British Columbia, the most important thing that you can do right now to help is to follow the orders that we've just laid out. This will allow us to have the resources that are needed to continue to address this emerging uh, emergency. Thank you. A reminder to media on the line, please press star one to enter the queue. You will be limited to one question and one follow up. Our first question today is from Mira Bain, CBC. Sorry about that. I was on mute. Um, okay, so I'm just wondering, how is the province preparing for the next uh, rain event that's uh, in the forecast uh, coming Monday? Is the risk of landslides being um, assessed and is that information going to be uh, made available to the public on potential risks? Obviously, we are watching the, uh, the, the, the weather, uh, weather reports very closely, uh, certainly in terms of stream flows and, uh, and flood advisory warnings, uh, be working with affected uh, local communities, uh, and we'll be making avail uh, information available uh, publicly on our, site, our websites uh, as, things, uh, as we become aware of, uh, aware of information and uh, understand the, uh, the full situation as it's uh, evolving. Mira, do you have a follow-up? Yes. Uh, how do you prevent uh, people from buying more than 30 litres at a gas station? We've been uh, uh, dealing with a lot, of, uh, a lot of challenges over the last uh, uh, you know, two years. And one thing that has uh, come through every single time is the majority of British Columbians in this province are going to do the right thing. And so if they know that it's 30 litres is, is, is what's going to help uh, keep our, our emergency vehicles running, that keep our supply chains open, that are going to uh, ensure that the, uh, all the goods and services that people are relying on uh, operating over the next 10 to 11 days, they're going to do the right thing. Will there be people that want to, uh, you know, not abide by that? Yes, there will. But uh, the overwhelming majority of people will do the right thing. That's how we've got through the last 20 months. And it's how we're going to get through the, uh, the next 10 to 11 days. It's 10 to 11 days where we have to pull together as a, as a province, uh, particularly here in the Lower Mainland. If we do that, we will succeed. If we're greedy, we'll fail. It's that simple. But I know what most British Columbians are going to do. They're going to do the right thing. Next question, Richard Zussman, Global News. Minister, how close are we to running out of gas? As I just said, uh, the measures we're putting in place today are to ensure that there is a supply of gas that is available to everyone to ensure that we've got the uh, ability to maintain the supply chains and the critical services that we need. Uh, we've been working very closely with uh, Trans Mountain. Uh, we've been very, working very closely with the, uh, the, the industry. Uh, and that's why over the next 10 to 11 days, uh, if we follow uh, the, uh, the orders that are in place today, we will be fine. Richard, do you have a follow-up? Uh, what sort of presence uh, should people expect at gas stations? Like, do you expect that police will be enforcing uh, these measures? And what about the support around the roadways? You know, is this something that we're counting on, you know, the federal government to help with? Like, how are we enforcing these new orders in place? Uh, first off, when it comes to fuel, um, so 
If you access fuel through the card lock system, as you currently do, you will continue to do it in just the same way, and you will be able to get the gas that you have in just the same way. Um, if you are first responders and they access their gas through their, their, uh, their methods, their supply places, it will be exactly the same as it is right now. It is the general public and the retail system where the 30 liter limit per visit uh, will be in place. Will there be police enforcing there? No, there won't. But at the same time, if there is a disturbance and someone in, just as it would be in any uh, retail uh, where someone is, you know, being belligerent or things like that, police could attend. Uh, but no, police will not be policing gas stations. Uh, in terms of the roads and the road announcements that uh, Minister Fleming made today, uh, there will be police presence uh, at, those, uh, at those choke points, at those areas, uh, those, th those, those critical areas. Uh, to in, to, uh, and it will be done in the form of uh, either roving patrols, as, such as the highway patrol that uh, police currently do, uh, but also uh, uh, road checks uh, will be in place, and uh, the public can expect to see that. They can also expect to see that, that those who don't abide by the rules, there could be a significant fine of, of, of about $2,000, uh, which I think sends a pretty strong warning. But again, as we've seen in the past, the people of this province will do the right thing. They will pull together. We know there will be those who don't, but the overwhelming majority of people will do the right thing. And if we do that, we will get through these next 10 to 11 days. Next question, Tyler Olson, Fraser Valley Current. Hi, thanks. In Sumas Prairie, a key dike failed. There are also key dikes around the lower mainland in the Fraser Valley that are insufficient to stop a major Fraser River flood. Upgrading them will cost billions. Is the province prepared to spend that much money on fixing those dikes before the next big flood? Right now, we are really pleased that we've got the, uh, the federal government involved. We've got the military helping in terms of shoring up uh, some of those dikes, building one of those dikes right now to keep uh, the Sumas Prairie safe. Uh, we have in this province ongoing dike maintenance and dike improvement uh, projects, but you know, events like this show very clearly uh, that uh, climate change is going to uh, impact us in ways that it never did in the past. And a part of that is, is, is ensuring that our diking system uh, is as strong as it can be. And that means that, yes, the province uh, and the federal government are going to be, have to be paying and investing uh, in the years to come uh, in, our, in our diking system. Uh, they are, you know, upgraded on a regular basis. Uh, there's maintenance done on an annual basis. But we also know that in many parts there are orphan dikes, for example. Uh, and work is, uh, you know, and, and there's thousands of, uh, uh, literally thousands of kilometers of, of dikes in this province. Uh, but absolutely, it's uh, an important infrastructure investment. Tyler, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, just on Highway 1 between Chilliwack and Abbotsford, is there any estimate on when that might reopen? Head over to uh, Minister Fleming. So the reports are that the, uh, the water levels are receding, uh, which is positive news, that inspections have been able to do, be done uh, on the condition of that stretch of Highway 1. Highway 1 remains a priority, but it also remains underwater uh, for the time being. And um, I actually might ask uh, for uh, an up-to-the-minute uh, assessment on that, uh, one of our Modi uh, personnel to comment. We'll send it over to Janelle State, Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure. On Highway 1 between Popcom and Hope, we've actually managed to, with the receding water, remove a significant amount of dis debris. We have established a path through there, and we currently have our geotechnical and structural engineers driving through the site just to ensure that it is safe and to assess any areas where we need to undergo further activity prior to be able to having a reopening. We do expect to have a further update this weekend on being able to get that stretch open. Indeed, the segment between um, in the Sumas Valley area remains underwater and until that water recedes, and it has been, at that time, we'll be in a better position to undertake a full assessment of our, our bridges and our culverts to determine the degree of damage and the timeline for repairs. So for that segment, uh, it's still going to be a little bit before we have an estimated time of reopening. For the next question, we go to Camille Baines, Canadian Press. Hi there. Hi there. I'd like to know what kind of a plan is in place for people who are displaced and need to quickly access financial assistance. Um, is there some kind of a preloaded debit card or anything like that that they can access, like what was done in Alberta after the Fort McMurray fire? Uh, what can people, or the flooding in Calgary, what 
can people expect in BC on that front? Um, so if you're evacuated to an emergency center, and there are 20 of them around the province, that are the emergency social supports uh, managed uh, uh, at those places, and people are then um, uh, provided with accommodation uh, and uh, the supports that they will need for the time that they, that they, are, that they are there. Uh, whether that is through meal vouchers. In some cases, uh, it can be uh, 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 debit cards for certain things, uh, but uh, uh, the emergency uh, support services are available at those, uh, at those uh, uh, emergency uh, evacuation centres. And as I said, there's 20 of them around the province. Camille, do you have a follow-up? Yes, I'm just wondering, there are people staying in hotels where they're not near any of those centres. Um, and I have a, another question as well, if I could, about the uh, when the vets are expected to arrive in BC. So, um, well, in, in often, uh, so for example, you have uh, significant centers in both uh, Kelowna and Kamloops, and they make use of, of local local hotels. Uh, when people are having to uh, leave an area under an evacuation order, obviously the first preference is to uh, for them to stay with uh, family and friends, and in the majority of cases, that is what happens. Uh, but uh, if that's not possible, as I said, you uh, the emergency support services are there at those emergency evacuation centers, uh, and there's 20 of them around the province, and people are provided with accommodation. Sometimes it's in, in hotels, sometimes it's in uh, what's referred to as, a, as, as group accommodation, uh, depending on the, uh, the situation. Alyssa Tebow, CTV. Hi, Minister. Uh, this may be a question for, uh, for Minister Fleming, but I'm wondering if there has been any discussion or any estimates at the moment of the total cost and timeline to rebuild some of this key infrastructure that's been lost. There is no, um, uh, there is no uh, estimate of what the total cost is going to be. And in terms of the timelines, I'll turn that over to, uh, to Minister Fleming. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the timelines uh, uh, for repairs um, are not available yet. I, I've advised people that uh, Highway 5, the Coquihalla, is, is going to be very difficult and we'll have some more information based on engineers and geotechnical experts who've looked at it, who are devising both temporary and permanent repair plans. Um, in terms of other uh, damaged routes, uh, there's, there's no estimate on the overall cost. It's going to be a lot. There's no question about it. Um, it's going to be very, very significant. And we're going to build it back to a higher standard. Uh, we need to do that as well. And we've had those discussions with the federal government too. And I'm pleased to say that they've um, been very helpful in, in, in offering support, uh, both on an emergency basis, but they've pledged to rebuild this province alongside us. Um, and uh, so it's, it's, it's just not possible right now to, for me to say how much will it cost to repair Highway 99 uh, to a, a better standard that uh, was, uh, it's even better than the pre-storm condition on that highway because I just don't have those numbers. So we'll get there. The priority, understandably, is to get those routes uh, reopened and usable. And again, it's, uh, it's a story that will be properly told on another occasion, but uh, there's been incredible efforts to even make that possible. Alyssa, do you have a follow-up? Yes, I do have a, uh, a question for, for my colleague, and this is for Minister Popham. Um, hearing from some farmers in the Abbotsford area that feed trucks are actually not being allowed into the evacuation areas anymore, um, I'm wondering if Minister Popham would be able to speak to that, whether that is in fact the case, because we are hearing that some farmers are worried about their livestock dying. Thank you for the question. So what we're seeing uh, obviously are roads that are incredibly dangerous still. And so there are RCMP blocks up uh, protecting the safety of the public. We do have a permit system that is allowing farmers to get through those evacuation blocks, but um, we are seeing the, the dynamic uh, situation with the roads. They can go from being potentially safe to very unsafe very quickly. And so um, we are trying to protect the safety of, of the farmers as well, but we absolutely understand that when a farmer needs to get in to, do, to feed the livestock that's in their barns, um, it's a critical situation. And so we're working a, as fast as we can to make sure those farmers are able to get through. Um, we have put a request in for more engineers through EMBC to the military. And I think we'll probably be able to get um, uh, the assessments done in a more expedited way. But um, we're really, we're, we're, we're being very cautious so that we don't lose human lives that way. At the same time, we understand farmers need to get through. Next question, Colton Davies, Radio NL. 
I was just curious when it comes to the gas rationing of 30 litres in southwest BC, uh, what are the boundaries for that and would that cover the, any of the southern interior? It will not cover the southern interior at all. Um, it is the southwestern uh, part of British Columbia, which was uh, the most heavily impacted. So you're basically looking from, from Hope down the, uh, the Fraser Valley, uh, Metro Vancouver, Vancouver Island, and the Sunshine Coast. Colton, do you have a follow-up? Perfect. Thanks for that. And uh, uh, also curious on another note, um, um, wondering if there might be a, some sort of um, special financial assistance available for those who have lost their homes uh, to rushing water uh, in places like Merritt. Um, I know in the summer there was a, a $2,000 benefit from uh, the provincial government for uh, people who lost their homes to wildfires. Just wondering if there's something similar that might be set up for this. Um, as, as, as you know, we're still dealing with the, uh, the, the assessing, uh, the assessment of the damage and the number of people who have impact, been impacted and how they're being impacted. Right now we have those emergency support services in place and I fully expect that there will be a, a, a further assistance in terms of how we're going to rebuild uh, and, and the work that's underway, disaster financial assistance uh, 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 programs and the disaster financial assistance with the federal government has already been, uh, has been, uh, been, been authorized. So there's a lot of work to do and we're going to be there with communities to get that rebuilding done. Next question, Ashley Wadwani, Black Press. Hi, yeah, so I just had a question about uh, Highway 1 between Abbotsford and Chilliwack. Uh, if everything does work out with the geotechnical assessment like you mentioned and can open this weekend between Abbotsford and Chilliwack, um, would this stretch of highway uh, fall into the non-essential travel ban that's in effect? Yeah, thank you for the question. So it's going to depend on what the conditions of reopening are um, based on the condition of the road and what kind of traffic management, traffic plans are required. So uh, we, it, it's premature to say, but what, uh, what Janelle uh, just reported on is that waters are receding, inspections are going well, uh, options will flow from, uh, from what we further see on the area that's uh, impacted right now and we'll advise the media and the public about uh, how, how we might use Highway 1 again once we uh, have... Some more answers to the questions about what condition it's in. Ashley, do you have a follow-up? Uh, yeah, I do. Thank you. Um, I know we're focusing a lot here on the Fraser Valley and the Southwest, and I'm, I'm just looking for an update on the conditions in Merritt, as in uh, current, and what is preparation work looking like for the potential next storm we know is anticipated for Monday to Wednesday, whether there's Canadian Armed Forces heading in that area, you know, any kind of update on uh, evacuation supports and, and the whole situation kind of around Merritt, if you don't mind. Uh, thank you uh, um, for the question. First off, uh, uh, Merritt uh, is not in that, uh, in that storm area. This is uh, for the, uh, the, the, the north coast. Uh, the work with Merritt continues. Uh, Canadian uh, armed forces are, are being deployed as to where they're, they're, they're most uh, they're, where they're most required and it's decided on the ground uh, by the experts uh, at the emergency areas. So right now, for example, there's dike building uh, uh, underway. Uh, at the same time, we want to make sure that the, uh, the, the, uh, those who've been evacuated in Merritt are able and act getting the, the supports and the services that they need, working closely with the City of Merritt because the fundamental challenge in the case of Merritt is that even though as the water recedes, it's that water treatment and sewage treatment plant that needs to be assessed and repaired uh, because in the case of Merritt, um, even though the whole town has been evacuated, about 2,000 were evacuated because of the flooding situation, but the rest had to be evacuated because of the water uh, and the sewage uh, treatment plant issue. As soon as that, the sooner that that is repaired, the sooner we understand the state of, of, of that's required with there, then once that's, that's fixed, then people will be able to return back to those areas. Next question, Kathy Glover, Country Life BC. Kathy, are you there? Failing that, we'll move on to Lasha Kretzel, City News. Minister Farmworth, um, first and foremost, are you not worried, though, that with the, um, I guess, essentially this, the honor system that's going to be in place with this fuel uh, restrictions, are you not worried that this might cause panic buying before that enforcement or before some people are even really aware, uh, such as the drive home tonight? We've seen, um, you know, many people lining up for gas stations uh, over the last number of days. Uh, this order is being put in place 
um, so that we are able to make sure that we've got enough fuel over the next 10 to 11 days. It is 10 to 11 days that we're looking at. Um, everybody is working as hard as they can. Uh, the Trans Mountain Pipeline Company, we are sourcing gas from other jurisdictions, Alberta, uh, Washington State, Oregon, and California. Some of it will come by rail. Some of it will come by barged up. Uh, and uh, the, the TMX has over 200 people working to get that pipeline up, hopefully, you know, um, um, by, uh, by, by middle of next week. At the same time, we need all of us uh, in the lower mainland in particular and in the island, uh, Sunshine Coast, to do our bit, to do our part in helping this province recover. Because there are a lot of people right now who've lost a lot. And if we do the right thing, follow this order, that 30 liters, uh, when, you, when you fill up, or when you, when you go to the gas station, just the 30 liters, that's all you need to take. We're going to ensure that the grocery trucks are running, that the emergency service vehicles are running, that the supply services that need to get to the affected communities are going to be able to do that. And there will be people who try and run around it, but as we've seen over the last two years, the vast overwhelming majority of people in this province will do the right thing. This is not about enforcement. You can't have a police officer at every gas station. But what you can have are good, hardworking people of this province doing the right thing. And over the next 10 to 11 days, and that's all it is, is 10 to 11 days of us doing the right thing, and we'll get through this. Lasha, do you have a follow-up? I do. Um, you had mentioned earlier that um, people who have been evacuated, that they have those 20 emergency centers across the province to go to. Uh, however, I fielded multiple, multiple calls from people who evacuated Merritt uh, who say that when they went to Kamloops, that they were told that they had to, one, first obviously register online, which they did, and then await a call before they would be able to access any sort of emergency funding. And they've been waiting for upwards of four days now for that call to come. And they've been told that unless that phone call comes, any expense that they have before that will not be paid back. That they could be out more than, like, they could be out thousands at this point. That people are sleeping in their cars because they don't want to incur the cost of a hotel before they get that phone call. Uh, this is specifically out of the Kamloops region. I want to know if you are aware of this and what is being done, because as I understand, some of the workers there feel overwhelmed. Some of them are crying. They are writing stuff down on Post-it notes. Uh, I'd like to know if the province is aware of this and what is being done. As I said, um, uh, we are aware of, uh, of some of the challenges that are faced uh, in Kamloops, uh, and we are ensuring that they are being addressed as quickly as possible. But what I can also tell you is, is that uh, the, uh, those emergency su supports are there. Uh, and if uh, there are challenges, they will, be, they will be dealt with, and the province is dealing with that. Next question, Mike Hager, Globe and Mail. Thanks for taking my question. Could you give us a tally of how many remain um, evacuated and, and from where? That's a, that's a hard number uh, in terms of, of, I can tell you that uh, yesterday there were 17,000, over 17,000 people on evacuation order. Today, that is down to about uh, uh, 14,000, uh, just over 14,000 people under evacuation order. Uh, about 4,700 people uh, have registered as, as evacuees uh, for evacuation centers. Um, as I said, the uh, earlier question, uh, the majority of people uh, do uh, stay with friends and family, uh, and that would be why you see a, a significantly lower number, uh, and that's something that we see uh, in, a, in every evacuation uh, scenario. Do you have a follow-up, Mike? Um, yeah, what about uh, contamination in the valley, uh, Fraser Valley, and I guess Cowichan area, um, Whatcom County issued an alert about asbestos. Are you worried about that at this stage, or is it still kind of um, evacuations and, and um, engaging kind of the safety uh, precautions about okay. returning? Yeah, so so on, 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 a, on a number of things when it comes to water quality, and I am familiar with that issue of the asbestos in Sumas, and that's because there's naturally occurring asbestos that is on Sumas Mountain. 
So it's not from anywhere else. It's naturally occurring on Sumas Mountain in Washington State, and so that's where that, that's where that comes from. Uh, as it regards to water quality, what I can tell you is that uh, in many of the communities, the first thing that is shut down are the, uh, uh, the, 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 and the water and sewage. So often, so in, for example, in Sumas Prairie, it was to shut that down uh, to protect the rest of the water supply uh, in the area. Uh, and of course, uh, public health does monitor uh, water quality. Uh, and so far, uh, things are, are, are fine. Next question, Doug Ferguson, Western Producer. Hi, um, I had a, a question for Agriculture Minister uh, Lana Popham. Um, I was wondering if uh, when you'd be uh, asking to trigger uh, ag, uh, ag recovery and also what um, other measures are being considered to help farmers. Thank you. So um, all of the uh, insurance programs within uh, the Ministry of Agriculture will be looked at to see if we can um, uh, uh, be able to support the, the, the requests and the claims that come in. But farmers are also going to be eligible for disaster relief, which they haven't been in the past. Uh, at that point, we will also need to assess what else is done. I've spoken with uh, Minister Bebo, the Federal Minister of Agriculture, and she has assured me that uh, we will be able to have support for these farmers. And so between federal support, provincial support, we'll be able to get them back on their feet. But uh, we haven't got to the point of assessment yet. Uh, we hope to be doing that as soon as, um, I guess, the things uh, stop unfolding as they are. But um, there's, there's issues like getting feed and accessing feed after this is over. So we have secured um, the feed for the, the recent future. Um, we will be bringing in feed and water by helicopter as needed. There's a helicopter on standby. And uh, I can tell you that uh, there's been so many um, contacts made from out of province uh, uh, asking if we, we need feed for the future, and I, I think we're going to have to be taking advantage of those generous uh, offers because um, we have feed for now for the Fraser Valley, but we're going to need some in, into, the, into the winter and into the spring. Doug, do you have a follow-up? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I was also wondering, um, given this, this would likely be the, the second time that ag recovery is going to be triggered, like within a, a few months, um, I uh, just want to get your perspective on whether there needs to be changes to these kinds of programs to improve response times and possibly to broaden them in, in light of climate change. Um, that's a great question and we just had our um, federal provincial territorial meeting where this was uh, one topic that was focused on. Um, there was coming out of that meeting there was an agreement uh, across the nation that climate that agricultural support needed to involve a climate change lens. And um, here in BC, we've already been adapting our programs to have faster response times and, and better customer service in that regard. And so um, we are well on our way down a path of, of getting that type of assistance when needed. And I think that it's very obvious to everyone that it has to have a climate change lens put on it. Thank you. Next question, Mary Brook, Island Social Trends. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Today, the CRD in Greater Victoria said that they can't pick up glass in the blue boxes um, for a while because the processing plants in Abbotsford and Quinell are not available. So this is a small inconvenience to, you know, in perspective uh, to people in the Greater Victoria area. But I'm wondering if you're aware of other types of um, BC-wide non-essential services that will be impacted because of manufacturing or other plants impacted in the uh, flooded areas we know that the um that this uh, this uh, this natural disaster has had a significant uh, impact uh, on many sectors uh, of the economy here in british columbia and people's lives uh, and and what we're trying to do is to ensure that we are able to bring normalcy back as quickly as possible that's why these orders are in place today in terms of transportation um, so that we can get essential goods moving, so we can get things moving. Uh, it's why the, 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 the gas rationalization is in place to ensure that people have the, uh, the ability to get fuel and to be able to do what they're needing to do. Um, you know, uh, some things are going to come back faster than others and others are going to take, or other, are going to take more time, but we're trying to assess each one and determine what the best pass forward is. Do you have a follow-up, Mary? Yes, thanks. Um, the, the disaster recovery program that was announced the other day, which, as you've noted, also includes farms now, but also local governments and agencies can apply, apparently. 
So I'm just wondering, what's the knock-on effect down the road for taxpayers with, um, you know, a storm happens in one place, but all of BC is affected? Do you have any perspective on that so far? This province is in an enviable uh, position. Uh, we have the, uh, the fiscal capacity to be able to deal with this, uh, with this, with this natural disaster. We have great partners in the, uh, the federal government. Um, everybody is doing everything they can. We are going to get through this. We are going to rebuild. We're going to rebuild back better. And um, we've got the fiscal capacity to do that. Thank you very much, everyone. That concludes today's update.